we have some visitors from not so far away and some from much further away, some from the land of France. So for Mr. and Mrs. Foucachon, vous êtes les bienvenus parmi nous. And we hope that you feel very much at home with us. And we come today around the table which God the Father has set in place through his son Jesus by the shedding of his own blood in the power of the Holy Spirit. And let me just make a few announcements before we commence worship. Today we come to this table that God has spread for us. It is for full communicant members of Gateway Christian Fellowship. And we would say that that also includes those who are sitting in the back row, that you are also welcome to commune with us today. Uh, it is, it is for those who love the Lord Jesus and who are seeking to walk by faith in him and according to his word. We observe this sacrament and we recently have changed our, our times for doing this on the second Lord's Day of September, November, January and April. And then we plan to meet again this afternoon at about five o'clock in Graham's and Helen's home for a fellowship meal. So if you can join us for that, about five o'clock, you'll be very welcome. We meet on Thursday, then Thursday evening, again in person uh, for our Bible study. We'll be looking this week at Genesis chapter 27. And that chapter is covered by the guide. So the questions for that chapter are in the guide. If you can take a look at them beforehand, that will certainly help you to prepare you for that time. And then next Lord's Day, God willing, I want to start a short series on the subject of the covenant, uh, entitled next week simply God's Covenant with Us. These are all our announcements. The Apostle Paul, speaking from experience, tells the Christians in Philippi and tells us too, for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. Let us now come to God together as we would praise him. In the words of Psalm 118, stands as 1 to 6. It's on page 289 of the Psalm books. Psalm 118 stands as 1 to 6. We sing these stanzas to the tune main, number 113. And the psalmist here is in a situation of some difficulty. You can see that through his words in stanza three. In my distress, I sought the Lord. To him, I made my plea. But it is the truth about God and his relationship with God that helps him in this situation. You notice what he says at the beginning of stanza four. The Lord is for me, I'll not fear. And how do we know that that's the case? How do we know that the Lord is for us? Because Jesus has come. Because Jesus has given his life. Because Jesus has joined believers to himself. And nothing can separate us from his love. And for that reason, we can thank the Lord for he is good. And because his love lasts forever, so that we may stand for him, as this psalm encourages us to do. So Psalm 118 stands as one to six. Let's stand if we can, and praise God together. <coughs> Oh. 
today and for your love as we have just been singing which comes from your goodness father we can only come to you the perfect God through the way you have provided yourself through the death of Jesus your son on the cross because by that death he has opened up a new and living way into your presence our father we praise you for what seems to be level upon level of voices singing to you in this psalm. All those of Israel, all the house of Aaron, all who fear you, like a great swelling, that swelling of praise to you that we read in the book of Revelation. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise. And Father, we praise you especially for the saving work of Jesus on the cross. This is the clearest mark of your goodness, of your unending love. Father, we thank you that you are good and that you, you have always been good. We know that in this past week, People have been praising our former queen as a good person. And that can only be true in any real sense if that goodness comes from you. Father, we would have to say to you, we are not good by nature. Instead, we are turned in on ourselves. We would make a religion of our own rather than bow to you and follow the way that you have led down. Our Father, we thank you that when sin first came in, you did not turn away from us. You did not leave this world to itself. Instead, you said that you would send a deliverer. And Father, we praise you that Jesus is the deliverer from sin. On the cross, he took all your wrath against all the sin of every believer in this room and paid the price for it. The wages of sin, the wages of our sin is death. We thank you that he died in our place so that we might be forgiven, so that we might become your children, so that we might be joined to Jesus, so that we might have your spirit in this world and a home in heaven. <coughs> Father, we thank you that Jesus drained the cup of your wrath so that today we believers might drink the cup of salvation. We pray that as we come to your word today, as we come around the table together, we would see again all that Jesus has done to bring us back to you and help us to see too what you require of us as willing and faithful disciples. Help us to really mean what we've just been singing. The Lord is for me. I'll not fear. What can man do to me? And our Father, we want to pray for two further groups just now. We want to pray for the royal family. I was just hearing the other day on good authority 
that the queen did indeed seem to be a true believer in Jesus. But it seems unlikely that other members of the royal family are. We do want to pray for believers who will have access to the royal family in these days, especially those who would minister your word, that they would speak of sin, that they would speak of Jesus, the deliverer from sin, and of eternal life to be found only through faith in him. And Father, we pray especially for our new king, that you would show him that to defend the faith, he must have a real living faith in the crucified and risen and reigning Jesus, that Jesus must be his king. And Father, we want to pray finally for those across the world who are really suffering for you, who may have lost their homes or their family, who may even be tortured because they're Christians. Father, we pray that you would be so real to them in the midst of their difficulties, that they can't keep quiet, that they can't but testify to your love and to your power. And Father, we pray that you would use such people even to break down the cruel resistance of your enemies. And we know, Father, we will be discovering from your word today that opposition to believers doesn't just come from the world outside, but can come from organized religion as well. We pray that you would help us to be humble and repentant servants of yours. Help us not just to rely on the outward form of religion, but help us to make sure that Jesus is our Lord and is our Savior, and that we are seeking to bring him honor day by day. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take your Bibles and please turn with me to John's Gospel account and chapter 15. John chapter 15. I'm just reading the, the last few verses and into chapter 16. It's on page 1135 of the Maroon Bibles. John chapter 15, we're going to read verse 18, and then we're going to read from verse 23 on. Just a few things to be looking for as we read this quite brief passage together. What is Jesus warning believers about in these verses? And what is he telling his disciples they're going to do to those who are close to Jesus? Finally, what consolation is there in these verses for believers? John chapter 15, verse 18. This is God's word. And Jesus speaks. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. Then verse 23. He who hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them what no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen these miracles, and yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in their law. They hated me without reason. When the Counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. All this I have told you, so that you will not go astray. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this, so that when the time comes you will remember that I warned you. I did not tell you this at first, because I was with you. Amen. May God bless to us this reading and also the preaching of his own perfect and powerful word. 
If you can just keep your Bibles open, we just spend a few minutes looking at some of these things together. Have you ever taken one of those containers of real orange juice? You know, the ones, the really fancy ones with the bits of orange in them. And without shaking it, just poured some of it into a glass. If you do that, what you get is a weak, watery drink that has little to do with real orange. To get the full body of the juice, it has to be well shaken first. So it is with the Christian life. Thomas Aquinas is probably the greatest thinker from the Roman Catholic Church. And this is what he said about his study of God, called theology. He said, theology is speculative rather than practical. In other words, you're meant to sit in your ivory tower, cut off from the world, and think great thoughts about God. Certainly Aquinas did seem to do that. However, John Calvin disagreed. He believed there's no point thinking or writing about God if that doesn't have a bearing on your everyday life. On the title page of his first edition of the Institutes, his most famous book, he stated that his book embraced almost the whole sum of piety. In other words, all that he was writing was to help us to know God better and to live lives of devotion to him. Talk about God is not just to fill our heads. Rather, it is to warm our hearts and to nerve our arms for the fight. And that is precisely what Jesus is placing before his disciples in those verses from John's Gospel that we've just read. Strong, nourishing doctrine shaken up and proved powerful in the crucible of life's hard knocks. So if I may, I want to take the shaking of the drink before the drink itself. And I want to just speak about that first and then we'll break. I want to take the first few verses of chapter 16 first. And Jesus there is predicting a hard life for his followers before we come back to the last two verses of the previous chapter, the fortifying truth that will help the disciples to withstand this pressure. So first of all, Jesus predicts a time of shaking ahead. Jesus predicts a time of shaking ahead. Just look at chapter 16, verse 1. All this I have told you so that you will not go astray. It's quite hard to translate the last word of that verse. It's the word that we get our word scandalized from. I have told you these things, Jesus says, that is, things about the world hating the disciples, so that you won't be scandalized, so that you won't be offended. And when you're offended by something, you can lose your focus. You can spend all your time thinking about the offense and forget about other things. You can lose your way so that you'll be blown off course. And that's why that's what Jesus is saying. All this I have told you so that you will not go astray. As the cross looms ever larger and it's now only a matter of hours away, Jesus' every thought is for his disciples. His every word is spoken to help them and to help us too if we would be his disciples. And surely it would have been enough for Jesus' disciples to watch him, to understand what he's saying. 
because for about three years, maybe a wee bit more, they had seen a life of matchless beauty and purity. Jesus went about doing good. He helped thousands of people physically, mentally, spiritually. His words carried power and depth and opened up windows in your mind. He never flew off the handle. He was never impatient. Even when he spoke sharply, it was to help and to challenge his hearers. I hope you read of Jesus often to see these things for yourself, to see this one perfect life. And yet the disciples had seen Jesus deliberately insulted, frequently provoked. A number of times in John's Gospel, they've wanted, they've even tried to kill him. Indeed, after Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, that's a miracle that the, the Jewish authorities cannot disprove, that they cannot destroy. We read this. The chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well, the man who's just been raised from the dead. Can you credit that? They refused point blank to move from where they are to the obvious truth that Jesus needs to be considered seriously. So the disciples know from their own experience that the perfect Jesus has been persecuted for doing nothing wrong. It doesn't take much intelligence for these men to work out that if they let people know they're followers of Jesus, they're joined to him like branches to the vine, they'll be persecuted too. Even so, Jesus wants to leave them in no doubt. He has already told them something about this in the verses we looked when we last came to the Lord's table. We looked at towards the end of chapter 15. And in those verses, Jesus was talking in general terms about the world hating and persecuting him and his disciples. But here in chapter 16, he's more personal. He's predicting what actual things are going to happen. And he mentions two in particular. If you look at verse 2, they will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering a service to God. Being put out of the synagogue. It's actually hard to exaggerate what that means. The synagogue was the center of Jewish life. It was where the school was situated. So this means the children of Christians would get no education. They would have no friends in the community. The synagogue was also the center for the community. Jesus is saying they'll be cut off from their own community. They won't be able to trade or to do business. They'll be unwelcome at every public event. The synagogue is also where the local Jewish court sat. To be put out of the synagogue meant no hope of receiving justice, no hope of having any grievance addressed. And of course, supremely, the synagogue was the place of worship. Followers of Jesus will be considered unfit to worship God, unwelcome in the place of worship. And if you remember, Jesus himself was put out of the synagogue in Nazareth for telling the people from his own town some home truths. His disciples, he's saying, you're also going to be excommunicated. And sadly, this fellowship has known something about this word, about this experience of excommunication in recent times. To leave the Catholic Church 
can be a bit like this because the Catholic Church plugs itself in to so many levels of your life. I wonder if you have known any of this estrangement for the sake of Jesus. We are a small group here today in a large city. Many people who would say they have a form of religion, but they deny the truth and the power of it. As if that wasn't bad enough, Jesus also speaks here of being put to death. A time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering a service to God. In fact, as he looks around these 11 men, don't forget Judas has already left. He's looking into the faces of possibly 10 martyrs. Only John himself, the writer of this gospel, will die of old age. But even John will be exiled for years to a penal colony. And notice who it is who's carrying out this persecution. It's not the pagan Romans. It's their own people, the Jews. They're the only ones who occupy the synagogue. The killing will be done in the name of God, not in the name of the state. Jesus is right, you know. That's who tends to give Christians a hard time. That's where trouble tends to come from in most churches. Not from the out-and-out unbelievers, but from those who think they're Christians, who are opposed to the pure word of God and the grace of Jesus, who are often enslaved by man-made traditions, who have a different agenda, as an example, some years ago, down south in Kilkenny Presbyterian Church, when the minister John Woodside and his mission worker Billy Patterson were there and were preaching a simple, clear gospel, they received most of their opposition <coughs> from the Church of Ireland, from people who had a formal religion, but an empty religion, rather even than from the Roman Catholic Church. And Jesus is very plain <coughs> about the reason for this persecution. Look at verse 3 of chapter 16. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. These people, many of whom could recite large chunks of the Scriptures, Jesus is saying these people don't know God. They're strangers to him. They see the sins of others and they ignore their own. Their sins are still on their own heads. They have some kind of works religion, which means making themselves right with God. So they think they don't need to come to God as guilty sinners through Jesus. You can't hate a Christian if you are one. You can't nurse a grudge or bear bitter feeling against a Christian if you are one. But if you find yourself hating Christians, persecuting Christians even, and it can come even from meetings like this, then you cannot know God or Jesus. <coughs> Now, we who are Christians here today, we haven't yet had to shed our blood for Jesus. We must give God more heartfelt thanks than we do, that we have freedom to worship him without interference, that we can even talk to people about Jesus in this city, on their doorsteps or in public places. But as I'm sure you know, the tide in this land is turning. In recent years, more than one person has been vilified for speaking out against what 20 years ago would have been condemned as sin. When people hear that a public figure is a Christian these days, 
there's little respect for that person. Rather, there's criticism. There are awkward questions. So many people don't want the church these days to say anything about sin. Many want to take the name of Christ, yet not be told they're wrong by anyone. We need to accept that it's going to cost to stand up for Jesus. Whether it's a smear campaign, or poisonous letters, or being passed over for promotion. It all reveals how evil the human heart is by nature. Such a heart cannot know God under its own steam unless God chooses to reveal himself to us. And that means repenting of our sin as he shows us our sin and believing in this Jesus on his way to the cross with all our hearts. Verse 4. I've told you this so that when the time comes you will remember that I warned you. I did not tell you this at first because I was with you. Up to this point, Jesus has been protecting his own. The heat, if you like, has fallen on him, but he's had his wings over his men. He's been sheltering them. Whenever he goes, they will be shaken up. A ship that's taken unawares by a storm has little chance of survival. But if a ship has heard the gale warning, has lowered its sails, has battened down the hatches, then it can ride out the storm. Do not make friends with the world. The world is out to destroy you, Christian. Don't forget what Jesus said back in verse 18 of the previous chapter. If the world hates you, Keep in mind that it hated me first. If people hear what Jesus really stands for, rather than what they think he's all about, they don't take long to sharpen their knives. It all sounds quite calamitous. It sounds dark and very difficult. But if you come back to what I was saying at the start, it'll fit into place. Yes, the container of the orange juice is shaken up. Not to cause distress, but for a definite reason. So that its full taste may be enjoyed. That's what we were singing about in our opening psalm. The distress of the psalmist in Psalm 118 drives him to cry out to God. And to learn that God is for him so that he will see his enemy's defeat. God's design in the heat of the flames is our dross to consume and our gold to refine. And this is why Jesus tells his disciples about his spirit in the last two verses of chapter 15. And we'll come back to those verses presently. Just for now, let's just bow our heads just where we sit and talk to God in prayer. Our Father, we do thank you for Jesus' frankness in these verses. We thank you that he doesn't leave his disciples then or his disciples today in the dark. We thank you that Jesus himself went out to face the greatest evils on our behalf. But we realize here that he is calling us to suffer for him, to show in that way that we are his, and even to be refined ourselves, to have some of the, the sharp points and the rough edges smoothed and knocked away. Our Father, we pray that by the power of your Spirit living in us, that you would help us to bear whatever the world may have to throw at us, that you would help us to be ready for these times, to stand up for Jesus, and to see you vindicating us just where and how 
you please. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. After the singing of this next psalm, we move into the communion part of our service. And the next psalm is part of Psalm 2 that we sing together. On page 2 of the psalm books, we sing stanzas 1 to 5 to the tune Hendon, 234. And the opening stanzas of this psalm give us the world's attitude to God and the world's attitude to Jesus, who is the Messiah mentioned here in stanza 2. And it's, it's quite a chilling thing that people are so ambitious in their hatred that they would want to destroy God. <coughs> and that's certainly what Jesus has been saying to, to the disciples. But the truth is that God has installed his king. That's what stanza 4 is telling us. He has installed his king through his coming, through his life, and especially through his death. And nothing and no one will offset that plan, will stop that campaign of God building his church. And really, all these stanzas as we sing them are about the praise of Jesus and the firmness and the wonder of his plan to rescue his people, to save his people from our sin. So Psalm 2, stanzas 1 to 5. Let's again stand and praise God. please come back again to God's Word as we look at verse 26 of chapter 15. <coughs> it's 
So Jesus has predicted a time of shaking ahead for all true believers. But here in verse 26, Jesus promises, if you want to put it this way, the strengthening drink of his Spirit. Jesus promises the strengthening drink of his Spirit. This isn't just teaching. For the sake of teaching, Jesus isn't trying to fill the disciples' heads with facts in their emotional state. They're not able to take in very many facts anyway. This is to steady the disciples' nerve as they face the oncoming storm. This is doctrine for life. They will not be on their own, even though Jesus is leaving them. They will not be on their own. He does not leave them as orphans. And nor are we left as orphans. There's much to comfort us and help us in verses 26 and 27. When the Counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. This Spirit is not a force, not a wind. He is a person. In fact, Jesus breaks the rules of grammar here to stress this. In Greek, the word for spirit isn't masculine, nor is it feminine, but it's neuter. They have three different genders in Greek, and the word for spirit is neuter. So it should actually say at the end of verse 26, it will testify about me. But no, Jesus does actually say, he will testify about me. Because the Spirit is a person. This person is the comforter, the counselor, the advocate, the helper. We've seen him before in these words in the upper room. If you just look back a little to chapter 14, look at verse 16. Jesus says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. He's not just a short-term visitor. Look at the end of verse 17. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. He's a permanent, welcome presence. And then look on down to verse 26. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. He will humbly take the great truths about Jesus and he will bring them home to all the disciples. So that, verse 27, so that peace my peace I give you so that we might have peace and be at peace in this most troubled world. We'll come back now to the end of chapter 15. The Spirit comes alongside us like a defense counsel when we face unfair charges. He is the Spirit of truth. That's what Jesus says. His weapon is the truth. The truth about the power of God and the love of God from the beginning. The truth that so many people today devalue. But the truth for which Jesus will soon give up his life as a sacrifice for others. Pilate will ask Jesus, what is truth? He should really ask, who is truth? Because the truth is standing in front of him. The truth which invades hostile hearts and breaks them down. And this is a person distinct from Jesus. Jesus will send him. He goes out. He proceeds from the Father. That's beautifully balanced. Jesus isn't sending the Spirit against the Spirit's will. The Spirit is going out willingly just as Jesus came into the world willingly. 
And this is a divine person. Who would the second person of the Trinity send from the first person of the Trinity except another person of the Trinity? And he does for us what Jesus would do if he were present. Because he doesn't have a body, he is present with every believer, in every believer, right now, all the time. So that we too have a love for truth and a love for Jesus, who is truth. Verse 25, or sorry, verse 26, is another of those verses that we sometimes come across in John's Gospel, where all three members of the Trinity are present together. They were all present to create the universe. They're all present to save God's chosen people, to help God's chosen people all the way through life. And these words about the Spirit confirm that Jesus knows his time is nearly over. He will soon be returning to his Father in triumph. His death is not going to take him by surprise. He's spoken about it so often. His death will not be the end. Jesus knows here, that's really the basis of what he's saying, he knows here that he's going to rise. How else could he send the Spirit if he was still dead? And one of the Spirit's most powerful works is to persuade us that Jesus has risen and that we, by faith in him, are his. So yes, Jesus will be overwhelmed shortly by the horror of the cross in Gethsemane. But so many times in these chapters, he's already looking beyond his death. When he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe and keep believing in me. And here when he promises, I will send you the helper to be with you always. Nor will the message about Jesus die out either. The Holy Spirit will make sure of that. As Jesus says here, he will testify about me. God doesn't leave a job half done. God's work is in God's hands. There's no chance of failure. So we come to the table that Jesus has spread before us today. Who is this table for? For those who by your willingness have surrendered yourself to the teaching of this book and to the authority of this congregation. You are ready to stand with Jesus even if it means hatred from the world. You know Jesus. You love him because he has loved you first. You believe he has died specifically for you. You have his spirit in your life so that you want to do what he wants to bring glory to Jesus to make him known when you get the opportunity. You're not perfect yet. You're a work in progress, so am I. But you're not what you once were. This book is the most precious book of all to you now, because this is the work of his Spirit. And he is leading you more and more to the liberating truth about Jesus. Let me just read to you the terms of membership which each person answers in our denomination in order to become a communicant member. And there are four of these terms. Firstly, do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments as the Word of God 
and the only infallible rule of faith and practice. And that's just underlining the importance, the essential place of the Bible for our belief and for our behavior. Secondly, about Jesus. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the only Redeemer of man, supreme in church and state, and in dependence on God's grace, do you take him as your Saviour and Lord? So that's an objective statement about who Jesus is in time and in space, but there's also a subjective side to it. Is he also your Saviour and your Lord? Thirdly, do you promise by God's grace to show a teachable and submissive spirit to the teaching of Holy Scripture as set forth in the testimony of the Reformed Presbyterian Church of Ireland? That's not saying that you have everything sorted out, but it's saying that you are on the journey. You have begun the journey with Jesus. And the testimony of the Reformed Presbyterian Church is a good gauge as to where you are with him. So the scriptures, Jesus Christ, a teachable and submissive spirit. And fourthly, do you promise with the help of the Holy Spirit to endeavor to live a life consistent with your profession of faith? And that really is just saying what Jesus is saying in in John chapter 16. My teaching is for your life. God wants a daily life of obedience in the power of Jesus by his Spirit. Let's turn again to the Psalter. Let's sing part of Psalm 116 together. These Psalms would have been the Psalms that Jesus sang with his disciples in the upper room. We sing Psalm 116 from stanza 8 to 13 to the conclusion of the psalm to the tune Ostend number 284. In recent days, many people have spoken about the faith of Queen Elizabeth II. And you can see in stanza 10 there, the death of all saints of the Lord is precious to his eye. And certainly in many different documents, in many different ways, the Queen let herself be known as the servant of the people. It talks here about your servant Lord, your handmaid son, your servant true am I. There's much said here about vows and oaths. The Queen made a vow which she sought to keep early in her life, right through her life. The vows that are referred to here are the vows to be true to God, to seek to follow him and and his son. Have we kept those vows? Are we seeking to keep those vows with God's help and with God's strength? Psalm 116 from stanza 8 to stanza 13. This time let's just keep our seats as we sing. Oh, yeah. 
Let us hear the words that God gave to the Apostle Paul that speak of the Lord's Supper, as we find them in the first letter to the Corinthians. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined, so that we will not be condemned with the world. Let's come together in prayer. Let's stand as we pray to God together. Our Father, we praise you that at your very core you are love. We praise you that the love of Jesus that we see in the cross is unlike any other love we know. It is vast, unmeasured, boundless, free. And that freeness is amazing. <clears throat> we praise you that Jesus didn't have to come all the way to earth from heaven. He certainly didn't have to die in loneliness, <laughs> in agony, forsaken by all on the cross. He could have called myriads of angels to rescue him, but that would have meant the end of the world. That would have meant the end of hope for everyone. Our Father, we thank you for Jesus' honest words, Jesus' amazing words that we've been considering today. That not only are we joined to him as believers in the good things of life, in the privileges of being your children, but that we're also joined with him in suffering. Our Father, we thank you that Jesus took on real flesh and blood for us, so that he might suffer, so that his body might be put to death for our sins. We praise you, he died the death that each believer here deserves. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. And we do thank you that he invites us in the bread that we eat together, in the wine that we drink. He invites us to be united to him, to benefit from all that he has done for us. Yet, Father, we need to come to you today in sadness of heart for our sins. You know that we have broken your word by our words. We've broken your word by our actions. We've broken your word in our thoughts, in what we have done this past week, even in what we have done today. And Lord, as we have been examining our lives in recent days, there is so much sin there, so much falling short, so little faith. But we thank you that you tell us you love your people with an everlasting love. You have given your spirit to us that we might obey your word, that we might testify to others of Jesus. 
Forgive us for our sin, we pray. Deliver us from our uncleanness. Lift up our heads now to enjoy fellowship with your Son through his body given for us, through his blood shed for us. We thank you that he has made each believer your son, your daughter, by faith. You are our Father. The Spirit is our helper, our advocate, our companion, our guide. We pray that you would feed us now as we partake of these elements together. Feed us by what the death of Jesus means for us, our forgiveness, and by what his rising again means, our new life. And Father, we pray that you would help us in the days and weeks to come to know that we are companions of Jesus, companions in his suffering. Help us to act like his companions by seeking to bring honour and glory to him alone. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Following Jesus' example of giving thanks and setting these pictures of his death apart from common use, we take this bread and this cup and show them to you, his followers. After Jesus had given thanks, he took the bread and broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And to show our union in Christ, we'll wait until everyone has been served, and then we'll all eat together. Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Following our Lord's example and in obedience to his command, we take this cup and again we wait to drink together. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. And Paul adds, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let's come back for a final time to John chapter 15 and the very last verse, verse 27. <coughs> verse 26 is talking about the work of the Spirit in those close to Jesus. And verse 27 takes that on, just in case you've misread what Jesus is saying in verse 26, just in case you've misunderstood, we Christians can't sit on our hands, nor can we retreat into a holy huddle. Look what Jesus says in verse 27. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. So this is really the, the third part of what we've been looking at. Here, Jesus prompts us to testify. Jesus prompts us to testify. He promises the hard times ahead, <clears throat> or he predicts the hard times ahead. He promises the strengthening of God's Spirit in order to help us, and he is prompting us to testify, to pour out what God has poured into our lives, into the lives of others. What a privilege we Christians have to be co-workers with God. The Spirit testifies to the truth about Jesus and Jesus wants us to testify too. 
these men can give an accurate record because they have seen all that Jesus did in his public ministry. They have heard all that Jesus said from the beginning. John knows Jesus is the most important person of all because this is what he writes about him. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and is God. So, Christian, quite simply, you are to speak about Jesus. Yes, there's a lot of talk about showing Jesus in how you live, and that's important. But that's not enough. If you're not speaking about Jesus, testify, the word is actually a legal word. It comes from a legal setting. Our witness, our testimony says that there is good evidence about Jesus that we believe, that we want others to believe as well. And in our witness, it's as if we're standing up. It's as if we're in the witness box. We are saying, this is who I am. This is what I believe. I am committed to this person. I am committed to the truth, to this book about this person. Speak about his birth for you. His perfect life for you. His words for you to show his truth. His deeds for you to speak of his power. <coughs> Above all, speak about his death for your sin and his rising again as if you were the only sinner in the world. You would still have had to go through that for you. His ascension for you and his coming back for you, it's all so personal. You and I can't predict how we'll be received. We will be shaken up, Jesus says. Not everyone will receive us gladly. But we'll be shaken up so that the full flavour of God's Spirit can flood out. We're not to shut up. One of the early Christians said, there's nothing chillier than a Christian who is not trying to save others. John Milton said that the martyrs, and in fact the, the root of the word testify is the word martyr, the martyrs shook the world with the irresistible power of weakness. May God be pleased to you and to use you and me too, Christian, to speak about our Saviour, about our real relationship with God in Jesus and may God fill other lives from us with his spirit let's stand and just briefly talk to God together our father in our lives and even in our witness as Christians we suffer the same things that other people do. We suffer illness. We suffer disappointment. We suffer rejection. We suffer bereavement. We suffer death. But we pray that you would help us not to suffer these things in the same way as unbelievers do. Because we know you. Because we know, because we believe that you are using even these things for our good and for your glory. Our Father, we pray that you would help us, help each believer in this room to have a real living relationship with you through Jesus, so that by your Spirit we cannot help but testify about Jesus to others who need to hear. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
We close our service by singing part of Psalm 31 together. Psalm 31 on page 55. We sing all of the psalm we find on that page, stanzas 1 to 6, to the tune Gainsborough, number 91. This is a great psalm of trust. What we need in a hostile world is a rock to stand on. We need a fortress to shelter in. We need a guide to lead us. We need a companion. And this psalm tells us we have all of this and more in God. You can see these different things mentioned. A rock, a fortress, someone to lead us, someone to guide us, someone who is our strength. It is saying in stanza four that people may try to trap us. Maybe to get us to say something that we don't mean or something that's not right. <clears throat> we need to commit ourselves to God. That's exactly what Jesus is doing. Jesus uses these very words in stanza five. At the very end of his time on the cross, committing what is, is lying ahead, everything that's lying ahead, into God's sure keeping. And look what happened in Jesus' case. The whole Christian church happened as the result of Jesus' death on the cross. And the stanza six is saying, we too must fix our confidence upon the Lord. So Psalm 31 stanzas one to six, let us praise God together. Thank you. 
Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.